Welcome to episode 48 of Talking Prisoner. We have another amazing guest with us today. Now, Ken, this is our guest's very first interview. So this is an exclusive to Talking Prisoner. Our guest appeared in 91 episodes between 297 and episode 392 between 1982 and 1983. A guest has a very big list of credits to her name in Australian classic TV shows and movies such as Power Without Glory, The Sullivans, Holiday Island, Bellamy, The Restless Years, A Country Practice, Carson's Law, Whose Baby, Rafferty's Rules, High Tide, Every Woman's Dream, Repeat Performance, Xena Warrior Princess and Shortcuts. She also played the regular character of Lee Palmer in Sons and Daughters from 1985 to 1986 and Nurse Carrie Burton in Shortland Street in 1992 and also had three different roles in Blue Healers. Welcome to Talking Prisoner, <laughs> Lisa Crittenden. Your list is huge. <laughs> Good morning, Ken. Good morning. Hi, Hi Ken. Hi, Matt. Thanks for joining us. It's an absolute pleasure. Fans are very excited, so we'll get stuck into it. But you do have an amazing list of credits to your name uh, with your career, so we're very excited. Um, Thank you. Where did you grow up as a child? Um, I'm a Western Suburbs Melbourne girl. Um, I was born in Williamstown and uh, raised in uh, Spotswood, South Kingsville. Um, went to uh, Paisley High School, for anyone out there that, that, know. that knows the West. <laughs> Um, and um, which was, you know, always going to be interesting when I started acting it as a teenager. There was always going to be fun and games at, at a local high school. Um, it was an interesting time um, being the, like, I, it just wasn't done. You just didn't go on TV, you know. So um, I was certainly... Um, put in my place if if I ever got out of my place I got put back into it pretty quickly um and uh worked lived in Melbourne moved to Sydney for work um came back to Melbourne for prisoner went back to Sydney married my husband went to New Zealand because he just happens to be a Kiwi and um he sort of kind of dragged me kicking and screaming over there um and uh, we lived in a rural area, surrounded by dairy cows and all that sort of thing. So I'd come from Sydney Crow's Nest to um, a rural community, which was lovely, but it was a bit of a shock to the system. Um, oh, excuse me, let me just turn off my phone. That's a slab, I believe, in the in the in the uh, in the in the old days. If you um, if your phone went off on a shoot. <laughs> you bought the crew slab. So um so anyway, that's gone. Um yeah, so that's where I grew up. Fantastic. Williamstown's a beautiful area. Oh yeah, but we weren't Williamstown, like you know, like back in nine I was born in the 60s and no one knew where South Kingsville was, which was where I grew up. So my mum used to say, just tell them we live in Williamstown. People go, oh, you live in Williamstown. Oh, it's so lovely. I go, yeah, yeah, kind of. Anyway. <laughs> now, I'm going to ask the next question about your school life. But before I do that, let me preface this by saying that my dog is right behind that curtain and my front door is right there. So if anybody <laughs> comes on the front veranda, he's going to go off like a, a Roman candle. Now, what were you like at school and did you have a favourite or an unfavourite subject? Oh, God, I hated maths. Maths, <laughs> science. Oh, my God. We have a tally, like... Lisa. With all the interviews we've done so far, there's only one person that's loved maths and that was Lois Colander. The rest hated it. Yeah, well, including me. Yeah, no, it was just not a thing for me. Um, I was your humanities subjects. I was good at school, and I was um, I was a nerd. I'm sorry, I was a nerd, and I didn't really fit in. Um, I didn't really fit in at school because. 
I had some friends and, and, and it's funny what you tell yourself over the years, you, you tell yourself, oh no, school days were terrible, but no, they weren't. I, I had some good friends, um, but uh, I was an only child and my mum and dad ran a pretty strict, you know, uh, military style operation. So um, I was doing speech and drama from the age of um, four, which led this to how I got into business, into show business but I know that's another another question um singing um all sorts of things and and I love school I did love it and uh um and I like my own company which was just as well because it was for a time there the first two years of high school I was pretty unpopular used to get my bag chucked in the mud and because Paisley was built on a on a coal dump and um, it, it grew each year. So it grew in size each year. So we're in portables. And um, yeah, my bag used to get taken off me and thrown in the mud or thrown on top of the lockers or I got pushed in the mud. And my mother used to say, what did you do? What did you do? You must have done something. And, you know, back, back in those days, bullying wasn't, well, it was a thing, yeah. but there was yeah. no kind of... Um, discussion about it and mum always thought it was I'd done something or I'd just fallen in the mud because that's what I like to do but anyway that was days, though. I mean I, I suffered bullying in a big way and it was always you know your parents said what, what did you do you must have done something and, and you hadn't I mean now we we're, we're open to all the discussions now and we don't do that but it's it's so true mm. so. what were you going to say Ken uh about bullying um mm. well back in those days it was a almost a prof profession yeah you know yeah. You, you had your your school bullies and you kept out of their way and and they were were bullies that would bash you up and i i used to just uh, make them laugh where i could mm. uh, as a way to avoid that when i went to tech school i became a prefect Suddenly, the boot was on the other foot. <laughs> but you know, I, I never pushed. You know, I, I I knew that I had the supposed power to do so, but uh, I didn't have the a bully in me, so mm. I couldn't do it. Yeah, I um, there was a group of a little gang that used to wait for me at um, as I because my dad used to drive me to school, and. Um, I'd give him a kiss on the cheek and they'd be all waiting out, you know, by the car. Kiss daddy goodbye. Oh, and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, that you can shrug off. It's a bit hard to shrug off a push in the mud or something. And, of course, my mother made me, and God bless her, she's no longer with me. And she was she was hard, but, you know, she did the, she did the hard yards bringing, you know, she did all the running around for me and, and everything like that. But, but I was made to wear garters on my white socks so that they wouldn't fall down. So, you know, you can imagine you get home and you've got mud all over your white socks. It was just, it was, it was not a good, uh, <laughs> it wasn't a good day if that happened, but, um, but yeah, so, but, you know, you survive it and, um, but you don't forget. You don't forget. Yeah. No, you don't. Yeah. No, no. Ken, we've um, done a Oh, lot. yes. 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 Um, what did you do straight out of school, Lisa? Did, was it, what was your first job or was it acting? So with the speech and drama or elocution, as we used to call it, um, my, my mum, um, uh, got me, she, she signed me up as a contestant on, um, I think it was Junior New Faces first, oh, wow. then it was Young Talent Time, and I did a couple of stints on Young Talent Time as a contestant, got to the semis, but, but never won, but I do have an interesting story, if I remember, um, about someone I worked with, um, in my other career, who, one um, oh, wow. young talent time. Now that's another story. But anyway, so she put me on pot of gold. Um, 
Kevin Dennis New Faces, Junior New Faces, Safeway New Faces, Quest 76, which was an ABC program. And I get up there and um, tell, tell a story or recitation. Anyway, Young Talent Time, the producer there was a lady called Leslie Shaw. And um, she said to my mum, after I'd done, I don't know, some recitation, it was called The Foal or something. And um, afterwards, and that was at the old, at, at Channel 10 in Nunawadding. So, and it was um, pretty much live recording. So it was, it was just full on. You've got the young talent team. You've got Derek Redfern out the out near the green room. Play, we, we played yo-yos together, you know, like it was the time of the Fanta and Coca-Cola yo-yos. And, um, you know, you've got them all. They were all so lovely. Those kids were great. And um, I was in awe. And um, anyway, Leslie Shaw said to my mum and dad afterwards, does she have an agent? By Monday morning, I had an agent because <laughs> mum didn't know what an agent was, but she got up, she got into the phone book and found an agent. And um, that was Active Casting Agency, which was run by Belle Ardern in those days. And, and then she partnered with another actor called Peter Felmingham. Anyway. So that started the extra work. So I'm, I'm, I'm very flattered that you announced that I was in Power Without Glory. I had two eps with about three scenes in, and it was all just, I just played Marjorie West, a young, young ver version of the, of obviously the older character. It was fabulous. And that, I'm probably going off topic and okay. apologies um, everyone. Um, the rehearsals for Power Without Glory were held in Elstonwick near the ABC in a great big, I don't know, it was like an office building. And there you'd walk in um, on a Sunday, I think it was, and Dad drove me over there and, and you walk in, there's Rowena Wallace, oh, wow. there's, um, oh gosh, all, George Mallaby, um, just... Michael Pate, every person I had ever seen, and of course I was about 14, 13 or 14, I just sat in the corner just lapping it up, watching, you know, of course everyone was smoking in those days, you know, you'd be sitting around, well I wasn't, but you know, they're all, and I just thought it was like the greatest gift I'd been given, I thought it was brilliant, and of course, you know, buzzing you know and so of course being um trying to always be perfect you know know my lines know when to come in you know all that it was just amazing it was um and so from and so it was it was lovely that you mentioned it but it was such a tiny thing and picnic at hanging rock I was an extra um devil's playground I was an extra but you know I met Simon Burke then who has gone on to be just a phenomenal actor and we worked together on the restless years we we were lost in a plane crash in the national park in Sydney you know like will we survive who knew um but um so that's what Val got me and then bit by bit so I learned from the the ground up a bit like um Tria with her writing and script editing. It's a process that you learn by being an extra, being cold, knowing, you know, you stand there, don't move, um, you know, that sort of thing. I remember my claim to fame in Picnic at Hanging Rock was sitting on a rock while the search was going on for the, for the girls with a dog. And Peter Weir said, you just sit there. Yeah. I think I'd still be there if someone hadn't said, oh, no, you go home now. Um, but, and that was all fantastic. It was, um, I was so wide-eyed and it was like, I mean, I remember watching Anna Ruby in Seven Little Australians when I, she was acting way before I was. And I remember loving that show on the ABC and one of the characters died. And I remember my dad came into, it was a Sunday night thing, I think. And I'm sobbing, absolutely sobbing because this character had died. And that still stands out for me, that show. And we, we did some great things in Australia. We did just on little to no budgets really. Um, and we, well, let's, you know, I never did Bellbird, but you know, that was huge. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
anyway, fast forward, shut up, Lisa. Um, so fast forward and then got the part in the Sullivan. So I have fast forwarded, I'd be pleased to know too. Um, finally got a part in the Sullivan's when I was doing year 12. I started on the Sullivan's when I was doing my HSC. I'd gone for quite a few roles in the Sullivan's had never been successful. Um, but Helen Rowlands, who was the casting agent um, and John Barningham kept bringing me back. And this was the role of Sally Meredith in the Sullivan's. And it was before Christmas and I went in there, did the, the, the audition and then, <laughs> and then it was Christmas time and Val Ardern was having a Christmas party for, for her actors. And um, I hadn't heard anything and I thought, oh, well, you know. So mum and dad take me over to, to Val's for the Christmas party. And I'm there and she says, congratulations, you've got the job. Wow. I went, wow. what? She said, congratulations, you've got the job as Sally, you've got the role of Sally Meredith. And <laughs> Peter Felmingham said, oh, you're a star now. And my, my parents are looking at him. Don't you be telling her that. She'll get a big head. Um, and anyway, I was so excited. And then my parents said, you can't say anything. But mum, dad, I've got the job. I've got it. No, no, you're not starting filming until the new year or whenever the, after the Christmas break, something might go wrong because so, they were always looking. Um, something was going to go wrong. So here I was with this absolute, I was fizzing. I had so much excitement, but I couldn't tell anybody. Um, and then, of course, it did happen. Um, and mum and dad's words were always the minute you start believing your own publicity and, and getting a big head, you're not doing it anymore. Um, so that became my existence for the, that year 12, which was, um, you know, mum would pick me up and she'd drive me, she picked me up from school, um, drive over to Abbotsford um, or to Channel 9, wherever we were filming, and then I'd come back in the afternoon. We also used to, like... Um, bless the 70s, um, there was really not a great deal of child protection out there in terms of hours that you could work and things like that. You'd, you'd work till 11.30 you'd, at night, you know, and then jump in a, an arrow cab um, and then and get sent home. Um, and again, the Sullivans for me was like my experience on Power Without Glory. I was an ad, uh, addicted to that show. I think everybody was. It was such a wonderful, wonderful program. And so I'm there on my first day. Um, so uh, first day is on location. And I forget what it was. I forget. Maybe it was Grace's funeral. I don't know. Can't, no, it can't have been. But anyway, so I get onto the bus, the Crawford's bus. And at the back of the bus, there was the makeup and hair. I've got my schoolwork with me. Dad's dropped me off. He was more nervous than I was. I, I go into the bus and there's Paul Cronin. Uh, uh, Hi. Um, you know, Susan Hannaford, Stephen Tandy, Andrew McFarlane, Richard Morgan. The lot of them. The absolute lot of them. And I'm thinking... I think I said to Susan Hannaford, you know, because they were very kind to me because, I mean, I looked about 12, even though I was 17, um, and I was so nervous, and they were very kind to me, and, and Susan said something, and, and then I said, because I, I didn't know what to say, so I just, you know, how you just have that, um, that moment where you just, the first thing that comes out of your mouth, um, it's my Bridget Jones moment, you know, and I said, um, how, I, I really like to know. I, I, I'm. How do you? How do you cry? How do you cry in your scenes? You know, like <laughs> I don't can't remember the answer, but I mean, but it was just that gobsmackingly 
amazing thing. And of course, no, no schoolwork got done that day at all. <laughs> so, um, and I had friends uh, at, in my classroom that were recording because I was missing a lot of school. And I had been, um, and mum, I'm not getting a big head, but I was an A grade student in year 11. And so HSC, my dad didn't want me to do HSC. He wanted me to go and I'd, he'd made me do typing and shorthand and he wanted me to get a job in a council. Um, and anyway, I wanted to do HSC. I wanted to finish year 12. So I was doing my best to keep up and I'd finish work and come home and then someone would have dropped off cassette tapes of my classes. And so I'd be listening and that, of course, the recording quality was terrible. And I'd be trying to listen to my English literature class and I had all this homework and oh, look, it was ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Um, anyway, then Sullivan said, would you like, we'd like to, you to continue on into 1980. So I finished school and I did pass HSC with a, what they called a compensatory pass, which was, I think the teachers just went, look, she's hardly ever here, but she's working her butt off, you know. Anyway, got a compensatory pass because that's helped me enormously over the years, that compensatory HSC pass. Um, um, so glad I got it. Um, and um, anyway, so then I, I, that was what I did when I first came out of, uh, out of school. And then Alona Rogers, who I absolutely adored, she played my mum on um, The Sullivans, Kate Meredith. And I got to work with John Waters and, and, and just Sam Neill came on set. He was love interest for Kitty Sullivan and, you know, just a wealth of people that were there. And uh, anyway, Alona decided that she needed to go back to New Zealand. And so they kept me on for a for 13 weeks. And then they made the decision that the character really wasn't working without her mum. So, and that was devastating. Yeah. Abs yeah. I thought, that's it. There it goes. Oh, there'll never be another job. You know, I did. I convinced myself that this was the one and only opportunity I would ever have. And that it was just such a gift and I was devastated, absolutely devastated. But, um, yeah, but then, you know, other things happened and, and there you go. So that was a really long answer, Ken. I'm sorry. Um, sorry, everybody out there. Just, just on the <laughs> Yes, I, I did. I worked on uh, I worked on the Sullivans when Grace had gone to England and died during the Blitz. Uh, those were about that time that I was working on. So I never got to work with um, um, Lorraine. Uh, Lorraine Bailey. Lorraine Bailey. Yeah. She was in Carson's Law. They were upstairs. I was downstairs doing prisoner or neighbours or whatever. So I never got to work with her then either. So I don't think she exists. <laughs> she's, she's just a figment of your But uh, Even yeah. Tandy, who I've just recently connected with, um, exclusive it will be coming on our show soon too wow talk about the sullivans yes and of course well, I, give him I'm my not... very best if he if he remembers me give him my very best my sure very best will. now my <laughs> my question oh sorry ken yeah I, I worked with um with dave sullivan um when he was in matlock police oh. so yeah so i worked on that series too you see that they were all like Crawford Homicide, um, Matlock Police, Division 4, loved them all. Like just, I was not your outdoorsy girl. and um, But so TV was everything back then. You couldn't wait to get home from school and you'd watch the Brady Bunch and all that sort of stuff. But then at night time, that's when it got serious, you know. And um, when I know that there is a question that about, one of my favourite uh, storylines in Prisoner. Well, that was working with Liz Harris, who was Leonard Teal's wife, who Leonard Teal, for those who are so much younger than I am, um, was Mac 
in um, Homicide, oh, and he oh. was brilliant. He was absolute. I adored him. So I meet, and I knew he was married to Liz Taylor, who had been on the ABC in Magic. No. Liz Harris. Liz Harris. Yeah, Liz Harris. Um, Magic uh, Circle Club. Yes, yeah, she was also in the, uh, um, I think she was at, at ATVO uh, and then went to um, the ABC and whatever their kids, Godfrey Phillips produced. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so I knew, like, it was, again, it was amazing. You know, and uh, but anyway, um, I've forgotten where we were. Anyway, <laughs> over to you. Well, my question was about what your parents thought about you being. In <laughs> so we, we've covered that. We know what they thought. Um, what they thought. So I'm going to change a question now. I'm sure Patria won't mind, and I'm sure you won't mind. Um, now, Patria Smallercombe, who I just recently interviewed, who was wrote some brilliant episodes for Prisoners and Prisoner, and has gone on to a Massive career. Now, you were her bridesmaid at her wedding? No, the other way around. She was yours. Yeah. Wow. So um, You're good friends. I'll just say we're, we're great friends. and But we did lose. She moved to England yeah. um, around about the time that I was having my first child. And um, we'd been terrific great mates on prison. That's where we met on Prisoner. Um, and... Yeah, she she was my bridesmaid. Um, she was there for uh, all the ups and downs and the good bits and, and the bad bits uh, in between prisoner and um, me um, marrying my husband and everything. Um, she's just yeah. extremely talented, yeah. beautiful person. But can I just say one thing? The irony about my parents... And they got me into this business. Well, they got me into the business, right? So, you know, it's it was a kind of thing for them, like I would say to them, be careful what you wish for, you know? So it was mum and dad, you know, driving me here, getting me an agent, doing all this. But as soon as it didn't fit the, the picture that they had, which was me marrying the boy next door, um, and being staying in Melbourne, that was kind of like, it was just, whoa, that wasn't supposed to happen. This was supposed to be like a little interlude, I think, until I got a job mm -hmm. as a secretary at my dad's local council, you know. So that's all I'd say is that they got me into it. And then I think they probably thought, gee, what were we thinking? But anyway. Well, normally everyone we ask this question, they, they say, no, my parents said, you know, you've got to get a real job. That's not a job. So... It's it's interesting that your parents actually, yeah. Well, yeah, I still think they they thought like dad, dad. Oh well, can I just tell a quick story? Yeah, please. Um, so after the Sullivans finished, um, Val called me in for a meeting with um, oh, Ross McGregor who was at the time the producer of The Restless Years. And he'd flown down from Sydney. And um, he, I was asked to come in and meet with him. So mum and dad, of course, in those days, they came along, um, even though I think I was 18 by then. Anyway, who knew? Um, and he's sitting there and, you know, with, and I hadn't watched The Restless Years because it was Grundy's. So this gets back to what you were talking to um, with um, Patria about the, the the kind of the us and them thing with Grundy's versus Crawford's. And um, and actually there had been some Sullivan's cast members when, when Restless Years was on, oh, I'd never do the Restless Years, never, ever. Anyway, so Ross, Ross is sitting there with my agent and my mum and dad are there and he's, we're talking about the Restless Years. And then he said, well, would you, Lisa, consider... Um, you know, being in the show, I said, yes. And he said, well, would you consider moving to Sydney? I said, oh, yes, of course, mum and dad. Huh? What? what? <laughs> um, and there was deathly silence in the car on the way home. Like it was, what? No. What? Yeah, well, you know, but I was an only child. I was terrified I was going to be tied to them 
they're good people. And how old, um, were, you, how old were you when that happened? 18. 18, okay. Yeah, so I was. I turned 18 um, uh, after I'd finished school, so in that, that second year of the Sullivans. So I turned 18, but I was such a, a babe in the woods. I mean, I was just so naive and so young and just, you know, oh, yeah, I'll do that. That sounds like a good idea. Um, yeah, so that was that, that story. Yeah, but yeah, so that's where it really went a bit pear shaped when I actually said I would take my career or take the career opportunity that presented itself. Wow. Next question. Do you remember that, Ken? The rivalry between Crawford and oh, yes. Grundy's? Yes, yes. Um, Grundy's and Crawford's always. And I, I, I worked on Grundy's programs and Crawford's programs, but never the twain shall meet. But um, I, I had a lot of respect for Ian Crawford, who I work with a lot of times, and with Hector and, and um, you know, um, they, they were they were a great company, and um, they came out of the radio years. When you mentioned uh, Leonard Teal earlier on, I, I was standing behind him at the Channel Seven canteen one time, and I'm thinking, right in front of me is Superman on radio, you know, and I was just in awe of Leonard Teal. And then, of course, I got to, to know him uh, um, and, and talk with him um, during homicide. And he's a, a lovely guy. And of course, I worked with Liz Harris on Video Village, which was an old Channel 7 show uh, hosted by Danny Webb and got wow. to know uh, Liz then. And of course, she was very very nice quite zany in her younger days but but very nice and weren't uh, we all we were all zany in our younger years and we were also very green as grass which i was when i started yeah i called everybody sir or miss or mrs yeah. same same yeah. Uh, like John Barningham. Hello, Mr. Barningham. Hello, Miss Rollins. Mm -hmm. It was like, oh my God, you know, seriously. But that's how we were brought up. It was, it was, you know, um, it's just what you did. It was, I think he's asked me to call him sir on the interviews, but I, I, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> but tell us, tell us, Lisa, um, when out of all your career and, and out of all the people that you've worked with and so forth and so on. Tell us who you, apart from the people that you've mentioned, who you admired and, and, and inspired you. Mm. Now, this one, this is, this one I don't think I've thought about. Um, I'm not supposed to ask hard questions, Ken. Yeah, like, you know, I'm old now, you know, Ken. Um, who inspired me? I think... <sighs> we can come back to it if you like. Yeah, can we come back to yeah, it? Because it. <laughs> I'd say Alona Rogers. She was very... Um, she was very um, important to me. Um, and there was so, look, Vivian Gray on oh, the Southern yeah. You know, like just, you know, you're working with people that have had, you know, even a lifetime experiences before they got onto the Sullivans. And of course, you know, as the old adage is, oh, you're an overnight sensation. No, you're not. You've worked your butt off for years and years and years mm -hmm. doing the yards, doing your apprenticeship. Um, and, you know, she was just beautiful to work with and kind and nothing like, it was a, just a, a, a different time and there wasn't really my 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 view of the Sullivans was I was working with a a whole host of 
absolute professionals. And I think that was the grounding, really. But particularly Alona, she knew her stuff. And she still calls me her daughter. We've stayed in touch over the years. We, we When I first got dragged kicking and screaming over to New Zealand, um, I think I was pregnant with my second son. And... I got a small part on gloss because they needed a pregnant woman and Alona knew um, that I was in, uh, that I'd moved over and whatnot. And so I got a call from um, oh, South Pacific Pictures. Could I come in? And I think I had a walk on, walk on extra role as a pregnant woman. And she's saying, oh, here's my lovely daughter. And, you know, and, 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 and she knew my husband as well. And, um, and, and, yeah, just beautiful values too, really good values. So there's your answer. Yeah, and you bring up Vivian. Right? I mean, she had a big career. But I mean, neighbours, Mrs. Mangle, she was just the best. I loved her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Myra de Groot was another oh, yeah. one. Yes. Um, yeah. Myra, de, Myra de Groot was on, um, she came in, I think, as Vivian's sister or something in the Sullivans. She had an enormous impact on me. She was crazy. She was you. She was just another force to be reckoned with. Like seriously, she. I remember walking. I remember I needed to buy a, a bed, and so she she came with me down to Paran to some I don't know Captain Snooze or whatever it was in Paran, and she's telling me, "No, you're buying that one. Then you're buying that one, and and no, you need to get this and." Like, seriously, she was a whirlwind. You just didn't say no. Um, but she was fabulous. And then, of course, she went on to Neighbours as well. Oh, and um, Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yes. Yeah, so uh, she passed away so young as well. I think she was like 52 or 53 that she passed away. Yeah. So. yeah it was, um, yeah, it was uh, very sad. Yeah. But, um, and the same with Sarah Kemp. Um, was something I was um, uh, she was I was very close to Sarah on Sons and Daughters uh, who she played Charlie and um, we stayed in contact after I'd left the show and uh, she got married I was so thrilled for her she'd met this man I think he I don't by I think he might have been a farmer or someone up in Queensland and she was happy and it was just wonderful and then I um was doing a bit of a search for her and I found out that she passed away and uh you know she was lovely she was lovely definitely anyway let's go on to happier topics not not passing it's away of uh, um, your favorite people do you have a hobby that you like um well hobbies I watch a lot of television I listen to audio books. I walk my dog twice a day. She's a rescue. Um, I do have a little casual job now. Just even though I'm retired, I'm retired from my my other career, which was um, I think you're going to ask me about that. But um, um, I've got a little casual job um, in customer service at a local, believe it or not in a local supermarket. And I was there this morning, boys, at 6 a.m. doing my bit <laughs> and then came home and got myself ready for this. So do you know what? I'm on overtime. <laughs> I'm going into the easier uh, questions category now. <laughs> Favourite <not> food. <laughs> Sorry? Favourite food. <sighs> Go on, say pasta. No, Thai. Thai, yum. Thai, Thai green chicken curry. Yum, love Thai. Favourite TV show that you currently watch? At the moment, well, we watch lots of Scandies on SBS. Um, for overseas viewers, that's um, uh uh, like like the ABC, except they do a lot of foreign series, and we just love we love Borgen and all sorts of things. But at the moment, I'm binge watching on seven seven plus the rookie, 
which um, it was funny that Patria said that I, don't, I haven't asked her yet what American crime show she's been watching, but this is just, a, I just love it. It's easy to watch. I sit there getting that iPad neck, you know, the iPad neck where you're just sitting in your chair and you look at you down like this. <laughs> And then you, you wonder why you can't move your neck because you're just binge watching. Um, yeah, we like the cheap seats on Channel 10, which has got a lovely um, Melanie, Melanie, gosh, can't think of her name, but she's a Kiwi and another guy, uh, Tim, and they're funny. But, yeah, look, and we like Gogglebox too. I said to my husband last night because some ad came on for, some reality show I said I can't wait for Gogglebox to come so that we just get a glimpse of what these <laughs> shows are about and then yeah. we don't have to watch them. that is a very interesting show Gogglebox uh, sometimes I think I'd like to be on it with my partner because we just sit there and just but I'd swear too much <laughs> I just say to my husband I say to my husband we'll be sitting there some nights watching a show and I'll say shut up Keith um <laughs> <laughs> so oh, Keith, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Keith sitting there with his gear and uh, the, the blue singlet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we've this covered story. a couple of questions, Ken. So, this, this, this next question, I, I, I have to ask this one because I'm not sure whether it's got to do with public transport or acting. But, did you train anywhere to be an actor? Well, this is the thing if you talk about Apart, I did, I was doing speech and drama for about 17 years and I did my several um, qualifications. I could have taught it, but by God, I hated it by the time I left it. Um, had a wonderful teacher for all of that time. And uh, sorry, that was my dog that's just got up and shaken herself. Um, so that was that, that was speech and drama, but it was very, um, you know, well-spoken and it was very stylized to, and I always felt quite intimidated by people who'd gone to NIDA. I thought it made me less of an actor because I hadn't, been to NIDA and of course I was working with graduates from NIDA on so many shows and I always thought that they had um, the inside running and the inside knowledge of, of um, what this business was all about or how to be an actor um, and I just learned on, on the ground up so I'd had experience but it was that thing of it's like when I was younger, I felt kind of stupid or not stupid, but um, I didn't go to uni, whereas a lot of my contemporaries had gone to uni, you know, and they got a, a degree in, you know, or BA in humanities or something, which, um, and I didn't. But I've learned over the years that to to see that for, for, for what it is, and it was just all in my head. No one else sort of said, oh, you didn't go to NIDA, so, you know, you're not very not very good. The only time that I found that was being a television actress. Um, some of, uh, I had a couple of mates who were in the theatre. And, of course, so they were, all their friends were theatre actors and actresses. And um, I just, did get the distinct feeling that because I wasn't performing at the Nimrod Theatre or the Sydney Theatre Company or all that sort of thing, that I was quite, you know, I'd just come out of prisoner, that it was quite lowbrow. Um, but then, of course, I realised that a lot of those theatre actors were getting paid peanuts and they couldn't wait to get a guest role on Prisoner, you know, they just because the money was good. Yeah. But then not long after I did a... I did a theatre and education play and it toured um, uh, various theatres around Sydney. And I got written up, my character, I, the show got written up in the Sydney Morning Herald. 
and and it said something like, "Oh, Lisa Crittenden, you know, she's she's okay." At, you know, I'm not going to. Anyway, it was a good review. I was at a party about a, that weekend or something, and all of a sudden, it was like that was the Willy Wonka golden ticket. It was like it opened the door. It was like, "Hello, darling. Oh, I saw your review," and I went, "Seriously." <laughs> That's, that's a, like a, a paragraph in the Sydney Morning Herald that was the passport to, uh, wow. you know, being accepted. Wow. So really, really interesting. And, of course, that meant the world to me. I was so insecure and feeling like, you know, um, didn't have enough street cred. Um, but anyway, so so that was that. How did we get onto that? Oh, we just... <laughs> No, that's what we do here. We just go off topic. It's good. I love it. I asked you, I asked you if you've bussed anywhere or trained anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> ah, yeah, no, just on the on the job. And then I had to unlearn my speech and drama. When I was doing the Sullivans, um, I remember um, working with Lorraine Bailey in a scene and um, I thought I was giving this performance of my lifetime, you know, and she said, or said to me, just need to bring it down a little bit. I didn't really know what that meant. And then, and then, um, cause I was really, you know, like I was performing, you know, like do it, do it, you know, like that's why I watch television now. And you, you watch the likes of Wentworth now and, and you watch, and I watch how, um, naturally the the lines in are delivered and 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 it's a you know I just watch Danny Cormack and I just go you know hats off Danny you know it's brilliant um and all of them yeah. and but back then it was still kind of um that performance that kind of um stiff performance so John Barningham sent me off to Patricia Kennedy another brilliant fine Australian actress who I knew of um, and I was terrified. See, the, the thing is you can go and be taught, you can go to class and, and to try to learn to relax, but if you're, if you're um, the person that needs to be perfect, you, you can't relax because you're worried you're going to get it wrong. So, you know, it was all supposed to ease me into being more relaxed on, on, you know, in my scenes and all that. But I was just terrified I was going to muck it up. So, you know, I think they kind of did their dough there. But anyway. <laughs> Curious to know, you know, you've mentioned some very big names like Stephen Tandy, Lorraine Bailey, uh, Vivian Gray, Myra DeGroo, who are just, you know, absolute superstars. Do you think learning from them, instead of going to NIDA, you get more out of that, being on the job with people like that? You're learning more. Oh, I, th I, think, I think so. I think you can't... Oh, look. Not knocking yes on either. No, no, but I, don't, and I mean, the thing is, you can go to NIDA but never have an opportunity. Yeah. You know, like when you look at the NIDA graduates... We know, we hear of the ones that went to NIDA that have gone on to do brilliant things. Um, and as someone once said to me, you know, it's 90% 90, 90 luck and 10% talent in this business. So I got the opportunities, I took them and I learned. Yeah. Some things I was good in, others I go, what was I? That was just disgusting. Um, but so there's a that yes, yes, NIDA is, is great, but also if you're smart and you get the opportunity to watch um, from those, you know, veterans that have been around and, and, and learnt. Um, I know you're good friends with, I think, Erin Gill. Terry Gills, is it Terry Gills? Oh, Aaron, um, yeah. Terry Gill, masterful. You know, like he, he, I did what a couple of his pantos, you know, that was, was brilliant. But, you know, you never said no to a job. So you could hang around waiting 
for the oh no I'm not doing I'm not doing restless years I'm waiting for you know yeah. Hector to ring me yeah. up and say we, we we're going to cast you as the lead in whatever um I think it it, it you miss the opportunity to learn and just even being on set, say, watching Peter Weir, not that I remember much about anything because I was about 12 or 13, but I was there. That was That's Australian history, film history. Yeah. So yeah. does that answer your question? It does. No, I just love to, to find. Do, I, I, do, I, you guys, sorry. do you guys throw in waterboarding as well? Like, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, Whose Baby, 1987. Now, I didn't know this was based on a true story. I had absolutely no idea. Uh, it was about the custody case of the alleged mix-up of babies in Kyneton in 1945. So you were in that. What was that like? Oh, that was... I, I would say, really, that was a pretty serious gig for me and um, one that I'm... You know, as Tria would say, be proud of what I've done. Um, I, I guess I was proud of that. I thought it particularly being a true story. Uh, 1945, two babies in Kyneton Hospital were swapped, you know, swapped. Two mothers came in to deliver. Who, who would have thought at the same time? Uh, allegedly, the babies were swapped. And I played one of those babies, Nola Jenkins. Now... Interestingly enough, I know one of the people, one of your fans of your show wrote and asked, did I have any previous motorbike experience um, before being Maxine? Uh, no, I can certainly tell you no, I had no motorbike experience. The thing that connected Maxine uh, to Nola Jenkins was Nola Jenkins was, um, she rode a motor motorbike. And uh, she was in, in a terrible, terrible accident. She ended up a double amputee uh, paraplegic. Mm -hmm. And um, playing that show, that was, again, with a stellar cast. It was uh, Angela Punch McGregor. Um, oh, gosh. I can look it up and tell you. I was looking at it before. Um, Reese McConaughey. Um, Drew and who Forsyth. was yes, Drew Drew Forsyth. Robin like, yeah, Robin and I, we were contemporaries. We'd been around in the same sort of shows. Um, that Moya was the, O'Sullivan. The, who? Moya Moya O'Sullivan. Oh yeah. Oh gosh, yes. <laughs> I mean, there, there was another beautiful character actress. Yes. But yeah, I got that part. It was um, it was a pretty um grueling audition process um and then it was even more like the the whole thing was um like nola was blonde so i had to um have my hair dyed blonde regularly for the entire shoot and i was living in sydney so i was flying back and forth and i actually um we were supposed to get married but you know um, my husband and I said, well, this is a great opportunity, so let's put off the wedding. Um, and so we did. And I used to have to sit there at the, at the hairdressers while they put, this is the old fashioned um, hair colouring. So this great big cap would oh. get Oh. And I know there will be people that are watching this will go, oh, yeah, I hear you. Pull the hair out with the needle. But, with the needle, yeah. And and they pull out the tufts through this bloody headgear and then this peroxide. Oh, my God. I was still blonde when I got married. Like, it just didn't go away. It took forever to go away. Um, so whose baby was, uh, it was quite daunting playing. I never met Nola. Um, she didn't want to meet, um, you know, be involved in it absolutely respected that but what a story and it was and this was I think the time of when um there was the federal government's 10BA tax um 
write-off thing. You could people had money to make dramas and didn't they, Ken? They there was just Crawfords were pumping things out. It was just there was another one I remember called I Live with Me Live with Me Dad. That was another one that they did, and there was just so much work. Um, anyway. I loved working on that show. Um, again, working with professionals, absolute professionals. Angela Punch McGregor was um, fantastic. I remember sitting in the in the bus with her, and at the and every time I hear, um, oh, what's his name? He's just retired. Um, drummer with Genesis. Come oh, on. Phil Come on. Oh, yeah, Phil Collins. Phil Collins was big at the time. And um, In the Air Tonight was playing and she just loved Phil Collins. And every time I hear Phil Collins now, I go, I can transport myself back to sitting in that bus with Angela Punch McGregor because she'd done We of the Never Never. She, like, she was just huge. Um, but the irony was like, so you get, you get these, this dream job and um, they flew me down for the launch and there was big publicity, you know, like there were nappies with whose baby on it. There was uh, mocked up bloody legal papers with ribbons and all this sort of stuff. And, um, and I remember having to go to the school oh, and a limousine picked me up. Hilarious. So Channel 7 or Crawford's sent a limousine to... Um, my hat my mum and dad's house in South Kingsville, Spotty, and this big black limousine rolls up. And so I'm sort of hi, hi, you know, to the neighbours and got in that go to Channel 7 for the screening. And there were all the reviewers there and and um Ivan Hutchinson, who was a huge, um oh, huge I'm in Channel cool. 7. Um, as a TV critic back in the day, he said some complimentary things to me. And, and then fast forward, there was, um, after it was screened and it got good reviews, um, I was nominated for a Penguin Award, which was the Film and Television Society. They don't have them anymore. Um, anyway, so I couldn't go because I was about to pop a little baby out in oh. Sydney. Oh. And um, it's funny what, what happens when all of a sudden you've got something else that's more important, it gives you a bit of a better perspective. Um, so I'm at home with this brand new baby that wasn't doing anything that it was supposed to be doing, like sleeping and, and behaving itself. And um, I got the call to say that I'd been. Uh, I, I had won the award for best supporting actress. I never got to deliver my acceptance speech, you know. On, I'd like to thank the academy and the this Delivered. and the that. So, <laughs> I mean, I don't want to I, look. Whose baby has gone off the radar? So I don't want to take up too much time of that. But I was. That was a pretty. Yeah. That was pretty cool. Yeah. And you brought up Ivan. And of course, I Sorry. Yeah, he, he was great. I mean, you grew up with television. You grew up with Ivan Hutchinson. He did, I think he did a midday movie or something. He's a bit like your, um, who's the guy? Who was the, the Collins, Bill Collins, Bill Collins on Channel Collins. Yeah, yeah, on Channel 10. Um, yeah, so so that was, that was, and it didn't really mean that much because I had this new life, this new baby and, and and I wasn't there, but apparently someone whoever accepted it for me said that there was quite loud applause. So I'll take that and um, yeah, there you go. Wow. Actually, Bill Collins a whole estate just went up uh, for auction not long back. All his all his belongings, the the estate put everything up, even his glasses. They they went for around uh, fifteen hundred dollars. Just everything. I. Yeah, amazing. Could you imagine trying to declutter that house? Oh, yeah. Oh, there was a lot of stuff. <laughs> now, we're going to talk about one of Ken's favourite shows. Yes. Um, 
this is a political or a politician's question because I already know the answer. <laughs> what, was, what was Holiday Island really like? <laughs> it was freezing. It was freezing. And is that the right answer? Because That's there's no the right other answer. answer. That's it. <laughs> Seriously, what were they thinking? Like, like <laughs> let's do a tropical paradise in the middle of Melbourne, in the middle of winter. <laughs> Yes. Like, you know, seriously. <laughs> uh, what did you say, Ken? They used in their mouth to stop the, the, the steam coming? Was it? Put ice, ice, ice. in their mouth. To, to, and, and the girls would get straight out of the pool and be wrapped up and swathed in these huge dressing gowns to keep them, you know, from freezing, from becoming <laughs> icy poles. Yeah, it's a very, oh, very strange. Time. Why would you make it? You could make it in Queensland or, or the islands or... No, let's do it in Melbourne. <laughs> yeah, but I think maybe they had some leftover props and sets from <laughs> different shows and, you know, like it would have been too... I don't think we, we thought about really doing much up in Queensland, although Sydney was starting to be the place to be, but... Um, yeah, I don't even know what I did on that on that show, but I do remember being, I do remember being cold. I, I think Hol Holiday Island was was basically a um, a setting for Tasmania. You know, <laughs> Holiday Island that's Tasmania, isn't it? Well, well, exactly. But you know, if they had a said, this is set in Tasmania, well, we could have all rugged up because we know that that's a different. Uh, climate over there. Oh my goodness! Well, you know, Holiday Island then become the the five star Lasseter's Hotel on Neighbours for the next. Oh, yes. Years. So we're all. Yes. It, it it worked out all right. Uh, recycle, <laughs> repurpose, recycle. Now you got an interesting story about your first day on set on the Restless Years. Um, can we talk about that? On the Restless Years. Ah, oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> talking about that Crawford's Grundy um, kind of thing. So coming from the Sullivans and from Crawford's where uh, location was shot on film and then studio was uh, on, on tape. Video tape. So, yeah. so on location, there'd be several setups. You know, you'd have your wide shot, your close up on on Matt, then you close up on Ken, there might be a two shot, you know, go on forever. Like who needs all those shots? But anyway, and so that's what they, and then there'd be hair in the gate because, you know, there'd be the clapper loader and, you know, they're, they're loading the film and then they check back and, oh, there's a hair in the gate, so we've got to go again. All of that stuff, which was, um, yeah, time consuming, but very, you know, like this was film. It was film, so it was, you know, up there. So going on to Restless Years, first day on set, on location, and I think I had to wear a bikini or something. It was a scene with Peter Phelps. And um, there were two things that stand out. Peter came up to me and introduced himself, and, and he said, oh, you, you, you worked on the Sullivans. Um, you know, that's, it's really great to meet you and such an experienced actress. I, oh, thank you. Now, I still don't know what I'm doing. But anyway, you know, that was that thing. That was the, the aura that uh, Crawford, the Sullivans had. It had that, um, oh, there's a New Zealand word called uh, mana. It, it had a, a presence, you know. And um, anyway, so then... We do this scene, right? So I do my scene, talk, talk, talk. And, you know, as my husband would say, a little knowledge is very dangerous. I just then turned to the first and I said, um, so who shot is it next? Oh, we're done. I, I, sorry? <laughs> um, oh, the scene's wrapped. We're moving on to the next. Now, I didn't see the camera over there and I didn't see the camera over there and I didn't know that you just did it in one, you know, you just walked through, hit your, if you, 
if you hit your mark and didn't bump into the furniture, that was it, done. Oh, <laughs> my bad. So, yeah, I was um, just thinking that all of that was, that you was know, the way you did things, you know, that there was going to be, I didn't know anything. Totally green, as you were saying, Ken, totally green. Anyway, moving on, next question. Next question is about a country practice. You played two different roles in that, Charlene Simpson in 1982 and Heather in 1984, both two-part episodes. Do you have any memories of a country practice? Oh, again, a favourite show. Mm. Um, you know, like every, every time... Every, every, every time I got a gig on something, whether it be Rafferty's Rules or um, a country practice or, you know, like I was, what, I was working with people I watched in my living room, you know, um, and Shane Withington, Penny Cook, um, Shane Porteous, um, Grant Dodwell, all of those people, and they were very very kind people and the crews and I haven't mentioned the crews but I ended up marrying um, uh, uh, someone from the dark side which is um, <laughs> he's a cameraman um, oh, he, at first, <laughs> he didn't he didn't know when I first met him that I was an actress because he had this saying that um, and I don't know whether I should share, but, you know, like, what, whatever. Um, he said, no, actors are just pieces of meat to bounce light off. And um, so, <laughs> as he was a lighting cameraman, it was a joke. To be fair, it was a joke. Um, because I didn't even know what that meant. So when, when he, he said, so, but I think he thought that actors were going to be pretentious and princesses and all that sort of stuff. Um, but he married me anyway. Um, <laughs> and um, anyway, oh, how did I get onto that, for God's sake? Country practice. What was the question? Uh, oh, um, yeah, the crew. The crews were great. That's they were hardworking, and I, you know, and I did have a better appreciation once I I started going out with my my. Uh, husband to be um because the crew th are there first thing in the morning and they're there the last thing at night yeah. and in between yeah. you'll have actors that come in they might only have two scenes for the day they come in at one and they're gone by four um the crew are on location in the weather um setting up doing just getting through the day they've all got families they've all got they've all got their own stuff going on um so all of the so many of um the crew crews that I worked with and even on on restless years I, I really loved working with the the um the OB crews because I was allowed to push the button that started the generator when when we were, we were filming um yeah, so, so um, but a country practice was that there was, you know, you talk about family, there was a real sense of family on that show. Um, and I, as I say, I did two guest roles. One, the first one, I think my baby got some sort of sickness from Chooks. And interestingly enough, that um, the father of that little baby is a good friend of ours and um, when that little baby was turning 21 they asked me to film a, um, a little uh, cameo wishing her a happy birthday and they played the scene where she was in she was in my arms or whatever and the other one which um, has stood me in great stead for all the American dramas and, and hospital dramas that I watch which was Munchausen by prox uh, Munchausen's disease. Oh, that was the character wow. that I was sent, you know, doubling over with pain and taking pills and things to make myself sick because I had a um, uh, an illness that needed needed uh, 
needed more psychiatric help than 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 uh, operations. But yeah, so again, interesting. They did interesting storylines. Um, you know, they touched on some um, really interesting issues. Um, so yeah, it was it was fabulous. And correct me if I'm wrong, and I'm sure the fans will. I think it was the only TV show in Australia to feature an Australian Prime Minister, Bob Hawke, at the time, was on one episode of A Country Practice. Yeah. I, 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 I don't know. I'm sure the fans will was... know more than me, but um, I do remember that, yeah. yeah. That was good. You also played Sandra in Rafferty's Rules. Can you tell us about your character and the show. So let me see, that was another great opportunity. Um, got the role and I got the role before we moved to New Zealand. And it was with John Wood, um, which John ultimate yeah lovely guy professional and I worked with John I remember reminding him of the fact um when I was about 12 or 13 um I can't remember the name of it now but it was an ABC telly movie and um he was in it and he played my father I've got some shots of um he and I on set um, and then, of course, we worked together on Blue Healers. And, uh, of course, he was also in Power That Glory. Um, and we worked together on Blue Healers and then um, Rafferty's. So there'd been this little connection along the way. And uh, I got the role. I didn't know it was going to be a recurring role, and it ended up being just that, which are, they're the gifts. They're the great, yeah. they're the great gifts <laughs> to get. You know, you come in, you go out, you know, you sort of, um, and I married Fulvio, um, uh, Archie, Archie Michaels. Um, and again, that was a top show. That yeah. was a, you know, that was, that was Jay and, was that Jay and P who produced that? I can't remember who produced that. Jay and P was a co country practice. Yeah. But I don't, yeah. I can't remember who, produced Rafferty's I know it was on channel Seven. um but yeah so uh, and Katie Brinson I worked with Katie Brinson um who were, had been on Prisoner as well um yeah you, that was the the great thing back then there was just this pool of us there were opportunities for so many actors Posse Graham Evans production. Is that sound oh, Posey. 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 Posey Graham yeah. Evans. She was also the producer of um, Sons and Daughters when I was there. Okay. So Posey is a formidable producer. She's She's got a lot of experience under her belt. Really? Um, ben Lewin, the show. Okay. Yeah, great show though. Um, yeah, so and I, that was, uh, I wore my own wedding dress. Fun fact, I wore my own wedding dress when I married Fulvio. Um, so, and then I've, we moved to New Zealand and we, I got a call to say, asking, asking me to come back for another couple of episodes. So I flew back, but I was also pregnant with my second child. So there was a lot of, you know, covering up kind of thing, you know, so... So right. yeah, that was, right. and that got that got, gave me a bit of a break away from my two-year-old that was running around like a lunatic on the farm, um, and I just got to, I just got to be by myself for a while. It was fabulous. Yeah. Um, now I am just looking at the time. Now Ken's got to be gone by two thirty, and we've still got some more questions. So unless you can do a part two, maybe next week with us. Um, otherwise, we'll get into prisoner now. It's uh, totally up. Get to into me. prisoner. I, I know everybody couldn't. They they really just want to know about. Oh no, no, they they love hearing before prisoner, but um, yeah, I'm just looking at the time, so totally. Go on. Okay. 
and I'm I'm happy to come back or do whatever you need to do. So you know, well, I'll be happy to do problem. that. Um, we'll just keep going then. If you, if that if yeah. that's okay, yeah, we'll just do the same time yeah. next week if that's okay. We can and um, just so we can talk about prisoner. Uh, yes, I'll I'll have to check my diary. To You've got a very busy um, life, this man. It's... Check with your PA, Ken. <laughs> uh, um, yes. Have Happy to keep going. Happy to do whatever you need. If, okay. if that's okay. okay. Your shot. My shot. Yeah. Uh, Shortland Street. You played Carrie Burton. What was Shortland Street like? Oh, it was, um, again, living on a farm in New Zealand. Um, I was really keen to um, do something for me um, and work again. Um, and the opportunity came up to audition for Shortland Street. So I did, it was for Carrie Burton, um, charge nurse. Uh, look, to be fair, I think it was very similar to Sister Scott in Young Doctors. That was another Brundy's um, production, which I loved. Um, so anyway, I oh, took them forever to make a decision. I mean, it was a it was I was a foundation cast member, so there was a lot of characters to cast, get the balance right, all of that um, carry on. And but it was just excruciating waiting. And I remember the day my agent rang me and said, um, "You've got the, you've you've got it." Oh my God! I screamed down the phone. I and of course, again, a, a thing of be careful what you wish for. I was so excited, but what that also, my husband was also working uh, in New Zealand at the time, uh, and so that meant we had to rearrange our family. And so we had to leave the farm. We had to rent a property up uh, in Browns Bay, which was uh, over the North Shore of Auckland. And I had to find someone to look after my boys, which all sounds very glamorous. Um, you know, you're going to get a nanny. <sighs> Gosh, it was just... <laughs> I, look... You know, parental guilt, leaving your kids. Yeah. Um, guilt because we had a nanny, um, didn't sit well with me and um, my husband. Um, we had some good nannies. We had some dodgy nannies. And, um, um, yeah, it was, it was fabulous. I loved it. I loved working. But, you know, there's that tussle, you know, yeah. I should be at home being a good mum. I shouldn't be doing, you know, whatever. Um, tie yourself up in knots, guilt complex, anxiety, the whole the whole box and dice. But Temuera Morrison, Danielle Cormack, she, um, she, I remember she had really curly hair back then. And, um, you know, Nancy Bronning, I know one of the... Um, questions came from one of the fans about Nancy. Nancy Bruning, who played Nurse Jackie Manu, um, was just a beautiful, beautiful human. Um, Ready? <laughs> There's your assistant. There's a, that's a slab. Um, <laughs> um, um, yes, and we had an opportunity to uh, record um, a single uh, on the show, and it was uh, Nancy Brunning, um, Jackie, it was her character, Jackie Manu, Carrie Burton, and a very well known singer in New Zealand, Annie Crummer, who had released an album that had just gone to number one. And I, I was a huge fan. And anyway, Brian Lenane, who was the then producer, and we'd worked with Brian on Prisoner, Sons and Daughters. Um, and then on Shortland Street, he said um, uh, Universal, I think it was Universal, or no, Warners want to release the single. And Nancy wasn't that keen. And I said, oh, come on, it'll be fun. And it went to number one. It went to number one for a minute. 
Okay, so the so it was released. We did a music video, and honestly, I'd never seen uh, like Annie Annie and her partner, her songwriting partner. They wrote the song "Keeping Up the Love Thing," and um, we went on a Saturday to shoot the video, the music video. Oh my goodness gracious me! I have never seen so much product put into my hair, like everything. It was like I'd never done anything like that before, and it was all the makeup was just amazing. And you know, I had long hair back then. It was it had all this kind of stuff to make it all shiny, and and we just spent all day doing pretty much bugger all, and um, but just sort of standing around a, a microphone, you know, getting different shots. It, it was fabulous. And then it went to number one and it, it knocked off um, uh, a song called Till We Kissed by The Herbs and Ray Columbus, um, icons in New Zealand music um, uh, royalty. And I remember Ray Columbus introducing himself to me at, at an award show and he said, congratulations on being number one. And I just thought, because it was a giggle, like, you know, it was just, it was such a wonderful thing to do. And Carrie Burton was a great character. I loved her. I absolutely loved her. Of course, there's, you're not in Guatemala now, Dr. Ropeta. That's <laughs> that everybody remembers. Even they've just had their 30, 30th birthday. Wow. And... Um, told me that a lot of the merchandise was um, someone, a friend of mine whose daughter is an influencer, um, received via ambulance just before the 30th birthday, via ambulance, all this merchandise with, you know, you're not in Guatemala now, Dr. Orpita, and this, that and the other. I mean, it's a, it, it's their kind of version of neighbours, I guess, yeah. but neighbours are longer, but um, again, Grundy's, they just know when you're on a good thing, stick to it. And um, Ian Bradley was the original producer. Um, wow. Then John McRae was producing. And John and, of course, Ian were prisoner, um, prisoner stalwarts. Uh, John McRae, wicked, absolutely wicked gentleman. Like, he had a... He had a very dry sense of humour. And Ian Bradley was gorgeous and his wife, Annie Lucas. Um, yes, yeah, so it was, um, it was, it was nuts. And we worked really hard, but it, it was really nice to be, for me, in my own, in my own head to say, mm -hmm. wow, I was there at the beginning. And that's for a lot of mm -hmm. actors to be able to say I was an original cast member you know, in the first 13 weeks of Prisoner or what you're all sons and daughters or whatever. It was just, it was just nice. It was, it was nice, but um, yeah, um, a lot of fun. Did you, have you heard the story about Ken and Ian having lunch at the Burvale before Prisoner? No. Oh, the Burvale. Is that place still there, Ken? Yes, yes it is. As far as I know. It is. If those, if those walls could talk. <laughs> yes they'd probably tell you a lot about me <laughs> <laughs> well you know what we learned from Ian in his interview is that you know Reg got very depressed with Prisoner after episode one and then basically handed it over to Ian so Ian was really instrumental in the, the ongoing success of the show plus everyone else on it of course so. well he cast me he cast me in prisoner, but I can leave that for, you know, part later two. if you want to. Part two. Yeah. Yes. Now, now it's time for. Actually, sorry, Ken, just just backtrack one minute. Now you mentioned the audition process. Sorry, um, about Shortland Street taking so long. Are you a fan of auditions or or, or not? Oh God, no one's a fan of auditions. No. Anyone that says they they love auditions, when when they when when you're pinning your hopes on something. And, and look, I don't know about any of my fellow actors, but I can only, and so I can only speak for myself. I used to feel pretty insecure in between jobs. Yeah. That yeah. how could I say I was an actor or an actress um, if I wasn't working? And, um, and so... 
and I guess for me, back in those days, my identity, my self worth, and my identity was wrapped up in being an actor. So uh, it was fine while you're working, um, but not so fine when not working. And so, you know, I always did other jobs. I worked in a stationery shop. I worked at the North Ride RSL pulling beers and working in the bistro with a crazy chef. Um, you know, just doing, sold, um, uh, worked when I first uh, finished Sun, uh, the Sullivans, I was working in, in the CBD in Melbourne at a, um, a lingerie shop, you know, washing the windows. So I was thinking myself at the time, why am I washing the windows? You know, it was almost a, it was almost a little bit. Don't they know who I am? Um, but Funny you say <laughs> that though, because when I interviewed some of the cast members from The Sopranos last year, one of them was saying, you know, he did twenty episodes of The Sopranos was huge, but then he had to go and work in a bar after it for the next job, and then people would be going, "What, what are you doing here? What, why are you here?" <laughs> and look, the general public. Uh, can be fabulous and they can be pretty brutal. I was um, working behind the bistro at the North Ride RSL. In, this is in Sydney for all you folks across the world. Um, and uh, someone said, I was, I was putting the bangers and mash on the plate and this, this gentleman said, um, you're, that, you're that girl off, off, off prisoner. And I said, yes, that's right. Well, you can't be very good actress then if you're working here. <laughs> <laughs> Stab me right through the heart. And then, but of, but of course, also there was the other time where some somebody came up to me in the bistro and said, well, you better hurry. The show's on soon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. So, yeah. <laughs> So, you know, very interesting. So not a fan of auditions. That's good to know. No, no, look, you can think you nailed an audition yeah. and never hear anything. And it can be soul destroying, especially if you've got bills to pay. And because it's not just about the love of the art. I mean, that's all fine and dandy. But if you've got children to put through school and bills to pay and you know like uh, being in the show in in the industry it's it's you know you're very very lucky if you make a, a living out of it if you get to to save any money um so auditions oh gosh it they're ex I think I'd be if even though I left the business a long time ago I don't think I put the same amount of pressure on myself as I did, you know. Um, yeah, no, they no, nothing about them I like at all. Okay. You know, I used to think I'll, I'll I'll continue to be an actress if just someone would just ring me up and give me a part. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, that's just the lazy Lisa. <laughs> I know what you mean about uh, dagger in the heart. We just opened a, a second shop. Uh, in a place called Reservoir and uh, a fellow walked in and walked around the shop and we're, we're sort of standing there all, you know, excited that we've, we've got somebody in the shop and he walked around and then he went to the door and he said, um, you won't be here long. Oh, <laughs> so, so I understand the chill cold of the dagger in the heart yes yeah yeah now um let's talk about xena warrior princess you played gabrielle's mother hecuba uh what was it like being in that show and and please tell us whether you got the part via an audition or not <laughs> yeah it was an audition what a show Terrific. Honestly. I couldn't crack that show for a long, long time. Um, and the funniest thing about it was at the time, um, I was pretty fit. I'd given up smoking. And when I'd given up smoking, um, I had turned to the gym 
and aerobics and uh, that's where I met my two best mates and and of course this is in New Zealand so I get this call come in for an audition for Xena I'm thinking awesome I'm going to be one of those you know short skirt you know, Gabrielle, Xena, sidekick kind of thing, you know, given the high kicks and the this, that, and the other. No, you're playing Gabrielle's mother. Right. <laughs> wasn't quite what I was thinking. Um, again, amazing fan base um, for Lucy Lawless. Um, she was amazing. Um, and, again, gruelling, gruelling kind of... Um, production schedule for her um, and the cast and crew. But, yeah, look, people, they know I was on Xena. You were on Xena. They love Xena. Yeah, yeah. I was Gabrielle's mother. Yeah. They had to, well, I think they had to put some extra pancake on me to make me look old enough. But, um, but mastering an American accent, oh, that's hilarious. I mean, I look at that. Uh, if I if I want to look at it and, um, oh, yeah. Well, I also remember during that time um, was Steven Spielberg was doing a film, and I don't remember what it was, but... Some of us got the opportunity to screen test, oh, wow. and uh, oh, wow. um, and I was one of them. It wasn't with Steven Spielberg, but it was for his representative in New Zealand. And because back then New Zealand was pretty much uh, a, a good place to to shoot, uh, exchange rate and all that sort of thing. And Every Woman's Dream was an American telly movie with Kim Cattrall, um, where I played. And again, this was like another holiday island. We were supposed to be in the Bahamas and we're in the middle of Auckland. Um, and Auckland's not much better than Melbourne in terms of weather. Um, and I was the Bahamian attache. And I had to come up to this yacht. And I don't even know, I can't even remember who I acted with. I know Kim Cattrall was there. And of course, the, the rest is history with sex and the city. But, um, but, so having to do a, an American accent, and, of course, I didn't know that you could. I'd had Kiwi accent lessons when I first moved to New Zealand because I couldn't get a gig, and, some, and my agent said to me, you sound too Australian. And, um, and uh, I thought, too so, <laughs> yeah, I was too, too Australian, mate, you know, like it was, oh, geez, me back. Um, so, um, so Elizabeth McRae, who I worked with on Shortland Street, when I first moved over to New Zealand, she um, taught me how to speak Kiwi. Um, and I was able to start getting the odd jobs, but apparently I never sounded Kiwi enough. Um, but yeah, so doing a, I didn't know that you could find an accent coach for auditions and um, so I just winged it, you know, like worst American accent you've ever heard in your life. Steven Spielberg would have just, I wouldn't have even made it to the to the, the cut that got to him, do you know? But I was really excited. I thought, this is it. This is it. All, all, the, all the fantasies are going to come true and they didn't. Wow. What an experience though. Amazing. Yeah, it was. It was great. Yeah. Out of all your roles that you've done, who would have, what's your favourite one? Your, your favourite character that you've played? I mean, we all love, love Maxie. Just... Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I think Maxie for me was such a... a um, off the wall, who'd have thought that the speech and drama kid would end up being a bikey, um, um, you know, talking like she did and uh, with tats and all that. I mean, <clears throat> it was, she was a great, she was a great character. I rem oh, no, I'm not, I'm not allowed to talk about prisoner now, am I? Um, I um, 
but yeah, and then there was Carrie, um, Carrie from Shortland Street. So for all of you people that I'm don't know what I'm talking about, I'm sorry. It's it's a New Zealand show and it's very popular over there, but it was just special to me. Yeah. I like, I like to ask this question. Um, has there been a character that's taught you anything in life? So you've played all these characters and you've actually drawn on something from a character. Oh, I'd have to say, I, I'd say no, but only, but I would also add that really, I guess I'm the sum of all of those characters that, they all, they all, well, every experience on every show taught me something about myself. Yeah. They were, there were good experiences. There were some bad experiences. Um, you know, um, it, it, you know, it's a, it's a very, very interesting time looking back to think about how old I was, uh, the company I was keeping, the shows that I was working on, um, what was happening in my personal life. And, and that's the thing. Um, as I was saying before about the crew, everyone's got stuff going on, you know, and you might have a bad day on set. And that might not be because, you know, you've got the, you've, you're, you're irritated by one of your your fellow workers or, or fellow actors. It might be because things are going really badly at home. Um, so all of uh, you're doing something, and you've got there's other facets of your life going on as well, and that can be good, that can be bad. Um, so, and it's it's like everybody. I'm I'm a firm believer that. Everybody has a story to tell. Doesn't matter. You might be um, working in customer service yeah. in a supermarket. But you've got a story to tell because it's, it's, it's you've probably done something else. You might be a world famous flamenco dancer. When I was working um, in my other career, we had people that were doing amazing things in their personal lives. So the fans have stories to tell. Why do they like Prisoner? What was it about Prisoner that, that, you know, they've got their stories, their lives. So, sorry, I'll go a bit deeper, meaningful. Someone pass the red wine, please. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, so, um, no, I think it's, it's the memories of the progression of growing up, I guess, is what those characters taught me, is where I was and what I, how I dealt with things. No, thanks for sharing that. Um, the next question is is something that I, I think I may have done more work in theatre than you, but have you ever done any theatre work? Well, other than that um, theatre and education, um, Max and Millie, it was called, um, and I did that. I forget, was it after Prisoner? Maybe it was, after, yeah, it was after Prisoner. And, um, yeah, look, you know, to I'd have to say that it was, I played a great character. Oh, well, she was a little girl. So, but, you know, um, it takes a lot of discipline. I've got some really good friends that are theatre actors and I watch them do those or oh, I know that they do their shows night mm -hmm. after night. Um, oh, there's an ad going on at the moment for um, Hairspray with um, Shane, what's his name? Jacobson. Shane. Jacobson, yeah. Yeah, it's Shane Jacobson. And it's you see him go into the theatre and then he sits at his mirror and he puts his makeup on and then you see him on stage and then you see him at the end leaving the theatre. And they do that day in, day out, matinees, everything. It's a discipline. It's an absolute discipline. I think that's why I like television so much is that what you were saying before, um, Ken, um, before we went to, to air, that it you do, a, you do a scene, get it done, get it in the can, move on to the next. 
So it's that kind of keeps it interesting and, and it um, you don't get the, uh, the smell of the grease paint and the roar of the crowd, but at the same time, you're turning over a new scene, new emotions, new this, and it's it's that's the difference for me. So I used to beat myself up about the fact that I wasn't a theatre actor actress too, um, but it just didn't. A couple of times that I got a role in something and then something else came up and I just didn't do it. I prefer television, and the money was better. To be to be <laughs> fair. <laughs> I think I found my, with doing these interviews, the hardest thing about theatre was that the, the cast have said that the audience can be so different each night. You can get a lot of laughs on, on one night and then the next night you're doing the exact same thing but you're getting no laughs and it's, yeah. it, it's a real hard one to crack. And I think um, also the capacity, the numbers that you can get in a theatre um, I remember going to see um, Sunset Boulevard. Now, this is a million years ago. Um, I think it was 1997. And um, I went to a matinee of, of uh, that. At the, I think it was at the Regent. There was nobody there. And, like, I didn't have a, 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 a flash ticket by any shakes, but they were moving us into the better seats for the cast. So... That's tough, you know, and especially post-COVID, um, you know, there, I was I recently went and saw um, Girl from the North Country and um, that, that was at the comedy, comedy theatre. And, again, it was a matinee, but um, there were, you know, it was, it was patchy and that's, that's, that's tough. It is. And it'll continue to be like that for another year or two, I think. Um, now, you've been out of acting for a while now. What what made you stop acting? Um, I didn't love it anymore. Okay. I didn't like it. I just, it, I just, I didn't like not being in control. And unless you you are an absolute superstar, you're not in control of your career. Um, I was driving over the Westgate Bridge to go for an audition for a Med Meadow Lee commercial, and I was really irritable. And I was just thinking, oh, I probably won't get it. You know, I won't be blonde enough. I won't be tall enough. I won't be young enough. I won't be old enough. I won't be blah, 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 blah. Oh, Why am I bothering? And I suddenly went, Lisa, you've got a choice. You've got a choice. Don't do something that makes you miserable. And it was making me miserable. So um, I, and I'd been um, working in a restaurant when we, first came back from New Zealand I'd been working in a restaurant and that's when I so I was doing that as a casual um, and also doing blue blue healers and a few other bits and pieces and a couple of ads and whatnot because we had children we had boys and they needed things and um and they I just went, money, children. they they didn't tell me that they're not a great investment. I've got one. No. <laughs> um, yeah, so I just suddenly went, this is not bringing me any joy. I don't like how it makes me feel about myself. Yeah. Very insecure. Um, not good enough. Not perfect enough. Not this, not that. It's a mess, you know. It's a, you know, for anyone that thinks it, it it's glamorous, it can be, but some of the mental cost it can take um, when you're dealing with people that maybe don't give a, a monkeys if you're you've had experience or not, that you're just, you know, the next person or the next piece of meat to bounce light off. Um, you know, it's it's that um, 
so it can be soul destroying. Yeah. And so I just gave it up. I just decided, okay, what, what can I do? What else can I do? And I thought, I know I like to do admin. So I got my, I was fortunate enough to get a part-time receptionist job in a real estate agent. And then um, did a, a certificate in business studies and um, got onto a book, a contracting book and books and got some gigs and then ended up fast forward 20 odd years later um, as an executive assistant to um, the CEO at a local government council. Um, so I fulfilled my father's dream that I would get a job yeah. in a council. He was so excited when I, when I joined um, my local council. He was excited. And so I was, but yeah, I worked at Australia Post as an executive assistant. I found that was my thing. I loved it. Um, you know, you could call it executive assistant, personal assistant, general dog's body, whatever. But that was something I found my thing. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And I loved it. It caused a lot. It was stressful um, because you're looking after somebody else and other managers and things like that. But I really found my thing and I have never looked back. I, I haven't missed acting. I would struggle now to try and do it in the world that we live in, um, you know, to, to do your own. See, now you don't you do your own audition on your iPhone and you you yeah. send it you, you send it in. So um, the the business has evolved, but no, very happy, very very so, happy. As an actress, it must be tough though. Like when you you've come off a major show and then you've got to think, well, I've got to go and get a job now while I'm waiting for the next part to keep the money coming in. But how do you get a full time job when you've got to be going off for auditions as well? No. It must be a, a really tough balance and so you you uh, you are uh, destined to be in a casual position or in a casual position with permanent kind of hours you know or shifts or whatnot but with the flexibility to be able to go off and audition for blue healers or whatnot um yeah it's it's not easy but if you if you're loving it while you're doing it, it doesn't matter. Make it work. It just doesn't matter. But when you stop loving what you're doing, and you want something better for you, for myself, for my children, because um, it's a ruthless business. You can be up there one minute and out the door the next, you know. And and um, I'm just very very pleased that there was. We had our privacy back in the 80s. You know, we certainly you would get um, someone who'd come up to you at dinner or wherever and say, excuse me, may I have your autograph? But there was no video phones. There was no iPhones. There was nobody in your face filming you, remonstrating with your children, saying, you know, for the love of God, put that violet crumble back on the shelf. <laughs> um, you know, that sort of thing. Whereas... I feel you're in a goldfish bowl more than ever. Um, so, but getting back to the work thing, you don't mind it. You, you sacrifice anything if you love it enough. But when you stop loving it enough, I say walk away. Well, I walked away and um, found that I could do other things. Gosh, you know, it was like, it was a bit like, um, waking you you know the actors dream that they realize that you don't actually know what you're doing like being a personal or an executive assistant I used to figure one day they're going to know I don't know what I'm doing <laughs> one day they're going to realize that Lisa Crittenden has no idea what she's doing <laughs> and uh and 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 probably my my dear bosses would probably go yeah we did think that a few times <laughs> um <it's> like, <laughs> Well, I don't know if Ken's worked out by now. I've got no idea what I'm doing, so but he's still here. So it's good. I'm still here. I haven't left. <laughs> I think that we probably should talk about a particular show 
that um, we well, all know. I, I think we'll do prisoner part two, I think, Ken, because what? Yeah. Have you got time? We can, we can squeeze in a little bit more. Oh, you want to do a teaser? Okay. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. But otherwise, the fans are going to kill us. We're all, <laughs> there's going to be pitchforks, flaming torches, you know. I might get called and a Nazi. I might get called a Nazi again. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, I've been called, I got called a Nazi last week. <laughs> that, was, well, that was Matt, not me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm more of your communist type. <laughs> Look, you appeared in 91 episodes of this particular show. We're not going to say who it is and what it is yet. From episode 297 of series four in 1982 to episode 392 of series five in 1983. He played a bikey, name of Maxine Daniels. Had you auditioned for any other roles in the show before this? I don't believe so, but it was, of course, the show it was it, it was the show and um you know you could actually kiss that rivalry between Crawford's and Grundy's goodbye you know like if you got on prisoner you were you were up there and of course my parent my my parents were they introduced me to Australian television in terms of what was watched on the box at home so um I got the call that there was a character called Maxine Daniels. Uh, originally, I think it was a 13-week gig. And uh, I was in Sydney. I think it might have been, um, I had to go to Grundy's in um, Artarman to, to do the audition. And I think back in the day, I don't know if you've spoken to Sue Manger, she was a casting, uh, casting person for Grundy's back in the day. And um, I noticed that I know that she's still out there because she made a comment um, when she saw that I was doing the interview with you guys and uh, she said, oh, nice to see you. She made a comment and said, uh, nice to see you still around. So she's out there and she'd be very interesting to talk to. Um, sorry, sorry. Um, anyway, so, um, and it was with Ian Bradley. So I, of course, freaked out. How do I play a bike? <laughs> What what am I really want the role? How do I play biking? I really I just needed some help. And there was an actor, um, actor singer. He he was the the full triple threat: actor, singer, dancer. His name is David Atkins. And David Atkins went on to produce the two thousand Olympic Games. Um, phenomenal um, entertainer and performer. And he was, I was living in a, um, in a house in Balmain um, with a couple of actors. And David had been in that house, but he'd moved, he'd moved out. And David and I, well, there's, an, there's a sidebar to that, but anyway. So I knew, I knew David and I said to him, I've got this character, I've got this character Maxine that I'm auditioning for. And he very kindly said, I'll help you. So I went round to his house and David opened my eyes to the world of better auditioning, the world of improvisation in an audition, what you can bring to a character other than what's written down on the script. And it opened my eyes because I was the speech and drama allocution girl. And yes, I'd had some, some other gigs, but I was still pretty straight laced. So David got me to do something with a cigarette and, oh, that's right. Um, I had a packet of fags. Oh, sorry. Packet of cigarettes mm -hmm. under, under my um, T-shirt. Trying to find the lolly fags. <laughs> <laughs> They're called fads now. I, I, I know. Do you remember that? Yeah, 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 I do. Anyway, don't want to upset anybody. But um, um, so, packet of cigarettes under my 
t-shirt um sleeve and anyway david got me to to he said look look do something with the cigarettes um and uh so what we ended up working out that i would pull the cigarettes out and during the, the audition i'd just improvise and say lean over and say hey you got a light and um so i did that to ian bradley so i walked in i felt that was the best prep i felt i'd ever been for an audition oh, no, one of the first times, probably the first time I felt ever prepped properly. And he was, David was such a generous person to help me with that. And um, anyways, <laughs> so poor old Ian, um, he didn't know what he'd struck. Like, I, I just, I don't know how I did it, but I sort of, I think I had badly permed hair at the time or a, a perm that was that was coming out and so I was, you know, going to be on all this, you know, probably overacting, I don't know, but you know, uh, yeah, g'day, um, you know, have you got a light? And uh, anyway. I just heard Maxine there. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, the rest, as I say, is history and I found out pretty quickly that I had the job. It was one of the best auditions I'd ever, I'd ever participated in. And also the the fastest result I'd ever had. Like you know, you've got it. And then of course I had to move from Sydney to Melbourne. Hi mum. Hi dad. I'm coming home. Um, but don't you be telling me what I should be should be doing. Um, yeah. And I was thinking about it last night, and I thought mum and dad didn't have a have a, have a choice. Like I, there was never any. Do you, would you mind if I came home and you know stayed while I do this show? No, it was just, I'm coming home. Um, well, at least they took was, back. I'm like, I'm home. You said, don't come home. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So um, so that was really good. And 13 weeks turned into another 13 weeks, turned wow. into another 13 weeks. And, um, and yeah, it was, it was a gift. It was a gift of a part. Um, we had some laughs. And Maxie, I was watching something on YouTube the other night in preparation for this interview. Not that I like to watch myself, you know, from the past, but it was, it was Lizzie being um, a mystic. Oh, yes. and, she, and it was with Lainey Dobson, I think. And Lainey had to go in and I had some towel wrapped around my head like a, and I'm going, ooh, and I thought, oh. <laughs> no, hilarious, and 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 Sheila being Sheila being Sheila and being Lizzie, it was just uh, yeah, they were credit, full credit to the scriptwriters and the editors and the the storyliners and all of that, like just comedy gold. That's was that's what I love about it. It was the comedy. Was that the first time you'd met Ian Bradley at the? At the audition, yes. Yeah. Yes. What was that like? Yes. Absolute legend. Oh, daunting. Like <laughs> I was talking earlier, it was Mr. Barningham, Mr. Bradley, Mr. This, Mr. You know, whoever. It was, but Ian was just um, really relaxed and really friendly. And, but of course, in my mind, producers were up here. And so, you know, it was never going to be, in my, my mind, this meeting of, you know, being mates or anything because this was my employer. This was, this was my boss and, um, you know, all, all respect and, and, and say, yes, please, thank you and, um, you know, all of that. So, but it was, it was great. He was, he was lovely just yeah. lovely to work with and then when he came over to, to New Zealand I felt finally that with Shortland Street like he walked in the door and it was just like oh my god somebody knows me somebody somebody knows me I I, I feel it a, a bit more at ease here because you know you're you don't come from Australia to another country thinking your dog you're god's gift you're on their turf you know, and, and, and the actors that I was working with on Shortland Street, they already had careers and, and, and um, credits 
and were well known in their country. So it was not about going over there thinking, hello, look at me, you know, it's, it's, it was, but it was really nice when you, when you had um, people from Australia coming over and going, how are you going, Lise? Oh, yeah, really good. Thank God you're there, you know, um, just because it was all new. And they, they talked funny over there. <laughs> they do so had you watched prisoner prior to getting the part you're a fan obviously oh god yes so. oh yeah. yeah yeah and that's what puts pressure on you or what's what put pressure on me is when you're watching shows like the sullivans yeah um and you're getting an opportunity to be a part of that show to be a part of that magic there's huge pressure i put on myself Got to get it. Got. I hope I get it. I hope I get it. You know. Um, yeah. So, getting prisoner, um, and then I and I said to David Atkins at the time, I said if I get if I get the role, I'm getting you a bottle of Verve. And um, so, a couple of days later, I knocked on his door with a bottle of Verve. And then when my contract got extended, I bought him another bottle. And then it was getting extended more often. I went, oh no, you're done. So. Um, but, but yeah, so uh, that was the story of of prisoner. Amazing. Um, character bra breakdowns for Maxine. Did you did you get any character breakdown for Maxine? And and what did you think about her? What did I think? Oh, it was all of um, pretty much. Sure, yes, she was a bikey, but she had a heart of gold, but she was this, but, she, you know, it's all that kind of we're going to, uh, you always got to find something to love in a character, you know. The audience has to find something to, to, to be drawn to in a character, in my humble opinion. Um, so Maxine was just your absolute contradiction um, of everything. She wanted to be loved. She, I know someone asked a great question about do I think I would have ended up with Spud? Oh, yes. That was a great question. Actually, we'll read yeah. that question now. I'll, I'll find it. And, and, and please give, um, um, please give the, the name of the person that, that, that asked it because it was a yes. good question. I'm just going through it right now. Uh, keep talking, Ken. <laughs> well... I was going to ask, I was going to say, when we first see Maxine, oh, what a shame. We've almost run out of time, so we can't go on with that little bit. So that's just a little teaser for next time. Little teaser. I'm just trying to find that question. Will I find it quick enough? Uh, I know that question because I thought it was a great question. Um, I'll ask you another question that, that is Matt's. Did you know anyone? Oh, I found it. Sorry. The show. Sorry. Go on. Find, find. You speak, Matt. Well, it's your question, Ken, but I will take it. Andy Dolman said, fantastic to hear from Lisa. Maxine was such a good character and her untimely death is still sad to watch all these years later which is a scene I want to talk about uh, next episode. My question is, if Maxie hadn't died, does Lisa think the character and Spud would have ever <laughs> settled down Spud and grown old disgracefully as bikers? Also, I really love the scenes Lisa did with the Dempster family as the babysitter with Michelle uncovering the child abuse was a really powerful storyline. So, um, great uh thank you andy for um the question um was it andy it was andy, yeah andy goldman i think he's yeah. in the uk from memory yeah um so no i don't think maxi and spud would have grown old disgracefully i think that spud was a near do well and that he um he didn't love Maxie. Maxie was a, but Maxie was so um, 
lost and looking for love and I think anyone that looks sideways at her she'd think it was true love and um and it wasn't love he used her he didn't treat her well not the way a young bikey girl should be treated um you know he pushed her over I watched something I believe I'm number 38 in prisoner characters on YouTube and when I was doing some research to try and jog my memory I saw a scene where I try to steal something from a, oh, I have to, I have to um, divert a truckie's attention. And I think I promise him a good time if he gives me a lift or something. And, you know, we're in, in the, the embraces and doing all, and which I always found very awkward doing those sorts of things. But, and next minute Spud's in there trying, knocking this guy out and all this sort of stuff. And I'm saying, Spud! Spud, oh, you're going to kill him. And um, <laughs> Spud grabs me and pushes me out the way. And that's no way to treat a lady. So, um, no, Andy, they weren't going to end up having little Spudettes. So, Spud uh, <laughs> little baby gems. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, time, time has flown. And, um, yeah, I'll wrap up unless Ken's got anything to add, but I really appreciate you coming on. It's been an absolute honour and um, I'm so glad that we're getting another episode from you to dedicate to Prisoner. The fans will be overjoyed. I do have two things to say. Lisa mentioned um, auditioning for Young Talent Time. I, I was working at Channel 7 in the 60s and so I worked on Brian and the Juniors. And to get away from Brian and the Juniors, I left and went to Channel O. <laughs> then, then came YTT. Wow. Uh, second thing I wanted to mention was uh, Ivan Hutchinson. I'm so old that I knew him when he was just a pianist. I was a pianist. That's right. He was too. Yeah. Never knew yeah. that. Yeah, um, way, way, way back in the 1960s. So were Ivan and Bill on at the same time? Were they like competition to each oh, other? Or? Possibly, yeah, possibly. Um, Ivan was a, a great movie crit, mm, uh, mm. As, as Bill Collins was, although Bill Collins was inclined to sing even the worst films' praises somehow or other, <laughs> but I, Ivan was a bit more um, ruthless than that. But um, yeah, he, he used to play piano at one stage of the game. I think uh, quite possibly on things like Time for Terry way back when, when Coral Druin was singing. Yeah, so nice guy. Another fun fact about Ivan Hutchinson is that I was an avid reader when I was a teenager. And this was before I ever was um, acting on the Sullivans or anything like that um, and I remember reading this book and I can't remember what the title was but I just loved it and I wrote a letter to Ivan Hutchinson saying dear Mr Hutchinson I've just read this book I think it would make a great movie if it hasn't been made into a, a film already um, what do you think and he wrote back he wow. wrote back just um, you know, dear Lisa, thank you for your letter. Um, no, I don't believe it's been made into a film. And yes, you know, like, I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed the book, yada, yada, yada. And signed Ivan Hutchinson. Oh, wow. So there you go. So six degrees of separation, really, isn't it? Yeah. You know, like we all have some kind of <clears throat> recollection or connection to the, to the past, you know, in some strange way. So well, every time I think of Bill Collins, it just reminds me of my school holidays, my grandma's who lived, you know, she lived in Burwood and she just loved Bill Collins. And I'd watch the movies with her at the night, Bill would come on and then there'd be the ones on the weekend where he came on during the day. And, and then the Saturday night ones. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm sorry, everybody out there, if we've just gone off on a tangent and you don't no. give a monkeys about any of this, but um, anyway. 
So. Fantastic. That was episode 48, part one of Talking Prisoner. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and share this interview everywhere you can. And please also like our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram page. And this episode will also be available across all podcast platforms, including Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Amazon, Google, everywhere else, and the talkingprisoner.com website. Thank you so much. Thank you.